I invite you to turn your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 2. 2 Timothy 2. We're going to read a verse, verse 2, chapter 2, chapter 2, verse 15, and then a few verses from chapter 3. Before we read this passage of Scripture, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would prepare our hearts, prepare our hearts to hear your word and obey your will. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. 2 Timothy 2, 15. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. And then chapter 3, verses 14 through 17. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believed, knowing that, or knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. That the man of God, we could add the woman of God as well, child of God, may be complete, equipped, for every good work. This letter, 2 Timothy, was written by the Apostle Paul to Timothy. Timothy was a younger man, and Paul acts like a mentor to this young pastor named Timothy. And in the verses that I read, Paul counsels Timothy regarding how he should view Scripture, the Bible, and what he should do with Scripture. Now this is the time of year when people make New Year's resolutions. I'm not going to ask you to name your resolution, but raise your hand if you made a New Year's resolution. Well, not too many, but a few of you have made a New Year's resolution. We know the common New Year's resolutions. I'm going to get in shape, I'm going to uh, eat more healthy, I'm going to get organized. Those are the common things that people resolve to do in the new year. As Christians, there are a few common resolutions that Christians have. Probably the two most common are, I'm going to read the Bible regularly this year, maybe have a goal of reading through the Bible in one year, or I'm going to pray more regularly, maybe spend a certain amount of time each day in prayer. So, What I often do each new year is just give a short series, a two-part series on encouraging you to stick with the resolution to read the Bible regularly, to pray more regularly. I'm sure as Christians, if you are a Christian, you you do believe that you should be doing these things, and maybe you are already. So, in this series, I'm encouraging you, if you haven't made this resolution, to do so. If you have, to encourage you to stick to it. And if you are already doing these things, then just to encourage you to continue to do that. Now, unfortunately, most people don't keep the resolutions. I've uh, read a statistic that 50% of people make New Year's resolutions, but 90 or 88% of those resolutions ultimately fail. 88%. That's discouraging. Those are discouraging numbers. And I don't want to discourage you. I think that making resolutions, that's something that's good. I think that it's good to make resolutions. They're worth Making, Even though we have these stats that we often fail to keep them, I think it's good to make a resolution, whether it be at the beginning of the year or any time during the year. So I want to think this morning specifically about the resolution to read our Bibles 
regularly, whether it be each day, five days a week, there are all sorts of different ways you can do it. How can we be more successful in keeping our resolution to read the Bible daily? If you don't have that resolution, I believe you should have that resolution. That you should want to read the Bible several times each week. And if we're going to keep that resolution to daily, or at least the majority of days in a week, some plans are seven days a week, some are five days a week. But the point is, regularly read your Bible each week. If we're going to stick to that, then we must do at least two things. The first thing we must do is we must believe, first of all, that the Bible is worth reading. We won't read the Bible if we don't think it's worth reading. So if you're not a Christian, probably you don't think it's worth reading. Uh, We know that each year thousands and thousands of books are being read. You go to the library, thousands and thousands of books are there. You go into my library, there's a few hundred books. I have Kindle books, I have books on uh, Bible software. I'm never going to be able to read all of those books in my lifetime. And so we want to pick out the books that are worth reading. Whether you read for pleasure or for gaining information, you want to pick out a book that's worth reading. Now, oftentimes we read a book, and we'll get to the end and say, well, that was a, a waste of time, or maybe we would quit partway through because we don't want to waste any more of our time. Well, the Bible, I believe, is a Bible worth, uh, a book worth reading. It's the book most worth reading. If we're going to stick to this resolution to read our Bibles, then we must believe that it's a book worth reading. In other words, we must have a high view of Scripture. We must believe that these words are the very words of God. If not, if we don't have that belief, then we're going to quit. And we might quit even if we do have that belief. So we must have that belief, first of all, that the Bible is a book that's worth reading, that it's the greatest of books, that it's the book that God has given to us to read, to know, to study, and to obey. Now, we read in 2 Timothy what Paul had to say about Scripture. He says in verse 16 of chapter 3 that all Scripture is breathed out by God. 2 Timothy 3.16 Breathed out by God. Now, in some Bible versions, that might be inspired by God. The Greek word that has been translated, breathed out by God or inspired, is theonoustos. God, theo, theo, noustos, breath, God, breathed, breathed out by God. It's really a word that doesn't occur anywhere in Greek writings that we have today, whether it be secular or Christian, Scripture, until after the writing of 2 Timothy. So that has led some people to believe that Paul actually invented this word that has been translated, breathed out by God. It does make sense because the Bible is a unique book. There's no other book like the Bible. And so there's really no way to describe how the Bible came to be, how it came to be written. And so Paul uses this word that we uh, often translate as being breathed out by God. All scripture is breathed out by God. These are God's words. I'd also like to read a few verses from 2 Peter. 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 16 through 21. And the Apostle Peter writes this, 2 Peter 1.16, For we did not follow, he's talking about himself and the other apostles, for we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of his majesty. 
It's talking about the Mount of Transfiguration. You might know that account from the Gospels. Verse 17, for when we, or for when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, for we were with him on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation, for no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That last verse is the key verse for this morning. No prophecy, speaking of a prophecy of Scripture, no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So what that tells us is that the Bible is both a human book and a divine book. It was written by humans like Paul and Peter, but it was also breathed out by God. All scripture is breathed out by God. And so God uses each author's unique style and experiences. But at the same time, these writers were carried along by the Holy Spirit. You could liken it sort of to a sailboat being carried along by the wind can't see the wind, you can't see the Spirit. But both are working. And so the Bible is both a human book, it's a divine book. Written by men, but breathed out by God. Can't fully understand that. But that is why we can say that so-and-so wrote this book. But we could also say that this is the Word of God breathed out by God, carried along by the Holy Spirit. Now, those two verses that I stressed, 2 Timothy 3.16, 2 Peter 1.21, they actually refer to the Old Testament. Because at this time, the, the New Testament was in the process of being written. So you might ask, well, what about the New Testament? What about these 27 books we have in the New Testament? Well, there's an interesting verse also in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16, where Peter says that there are some things in, and he's talking about Paul's letters, some things in Paul's letters that are hard to understand. He says, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction. And he says, as they do the other scriptures. So that implies that Peter believed that Paul's letters were scripture, like the Old Testament scriptures. Also, uh, Paul in second, uh, 1 Timothy 5, 18, he, he quotes the words of Jesus that we have recorded in Luke 10, 7. He, record, uh, he quotes them as scripture. He says, the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain, and the laborer deserves his wages. And so, so Paul quoted the gospel of Luke as scripture. And so we have these two Testaments, Old Testament, New Testament. Written by men, like us. But written in such a way that these words were breathed out by God. And these authors were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And so we can say, these men wrote it. But we can also say that these words are the words of God. Words without error. Because God does not make mistakes. Some people might say, well, this is English. Paul, for example, wrote in Greek. And some people have the wrong idea that what we have today is a translation of a translation of a translation of a translation of a translation. So that what was written in the beginning is very much different from what we have in our English Bibles today. But that's really not the case. They sort of liken it, you may have heard this argument before where they liken it to a game of telephone where someone whispers in a person's ear, 
sentence and it goes around the room, each person whispering in each other's ears until the last person says aloud what they think was said and it's something very different from what was said in the beginning. But that's not really how it came to be with the Bible. Uh, The Bible was written, as I said, by, for example, Paul. The New Testament was written in Greek and then there were many copies in Greek of Paul's original letters. And then we have those copies. There are, of course, a few discrepancies as you go along, but most, mostly they're just minor discrepancies between the various copies. And then today we go back to those copies in Greek and translate them into English. So it's really only a three-part thing where they're originally written without error. They've been copied few discrepancies, but nothing major. And then today we can translate that from Greek into English or whatever language we desire. And so I believe that in God's providence, he has preserved his word for us. So that today, though there are slight discrepancies between some versions of the Bible, generally we can say that we have the word of God. Uh, The psalmist says in Psalm 119, verse 16, I will delight in your statutes. I will not forget your word. Delight in your statutes. Will not forget your word. Uh, The Hebrew word for forget means to lay aside, to forget, to take for granted, to neglect. Sometimes we can make those resolutions And then a few weeks later, we realize, forgot about that. That shouldn't be true about our resolution to read the Bible. But that can happen. We can forget about our Bibles. We can lay them aside. We can forget about them. Take it for granted. Neglect to read God's Word. Now, if we really, truly do believe that that this book is God's word. These words are words that God has given to us to read. Then we shouldn't neglect to read the Bible. We should have at least the desire to read God's word. As Paul writes, the words of the Bible are profitable. They're profitable for us for many different reasons. And he lays several out in 2 Timothy 3.16. A lot of books are not profitable to be read. Again, a waste of time. But the Bible is a book that's always able to give us something we need. So we must have the belief that the Bible is a book that's worth reading. And secondly, we must have a plan. We must have a plan. Uh, Paul tells Timothy in 2 Timothy 2.15, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. He says, do your best. That doesn't mean, well, we'll just do your best if you you fail, that's okay. If you don't, that's okay. It's really stronger than that. It means to be zealous. To have an extremely strong desire to do this and not fail. He likens Timothy, and we could say every believer, to a worker, a laborer, who rightly handles the word of truth, the Bible. You know, for someone to work effectively, to a laborer, a carpenter, someone like that, to work effectively, they need a plan. You know, you could start to build a shed and not really have a plan and... uh, In the end, it could be not level, walls crooked. And that would be to the builder's shame. To always see that shed out there that was built really without a good plan. And that's the same thing, I believe, for believers. It's to our shame if we don't read the Bible, if we don't learn from it, if we really don't understand the Bible or or can't explain much about the Bible, if we've been a Christian for many years, then that's to our shame. 
Just like a builder who builds, but he doesn't rightly handle his tools and builds things that are not very well built. We need a plan, I think, to stick to this reading of God's Word. And with that plan, of course, we also need the desire and we need the dedication. Uh, recently, I read an article by blogger Tim Challies entitled How to Keep or How to Make How to Make a New Year's Resolution That Sticks. And this was a, a blog post about resolutions in general, not specifically about the resolution to read the Bible. But I think we can apply much of what he says, uh, and he's a believer, uh, much of what he says to this resolution to read the Bible regularly each week. Uh, he says make resolutions, first of all. I'm just going to share a few of these tips. Make resolutions, not wishes. You know, wishing upon a star might work in a Disney movie, but in real life, uh, it doesn't work that way. Uh, just wishing that something might happen. Like wishing I would read the Bible through this year. Doesn't mean it's going to happen. So a resolution has to be more than just a wish. It has to be a real resolution. That we have a strong desire to do. And he says make a plan. And that was my point. Make a plan. It's often said if you fail to plan... You plan to fail. If you're resolving to, to read the Bible regularly, you need a plan. This, uh, this year I've, I've made the resolution to try to read through the Bible during this year. And uh, I'm following a plan called the uh, Robert Murray McShane Reading plan, you read four chapters a day. It started off with Genesis 1, Ezra 1, Matthew 1, Acts 1. So you read a couple of chapters from the Old Testament, uh, maybe three or one or two from the New Testament. So that's, that's a plan. Also, I resolved to get up a little earlier to do this because I found that when the house gets a little uh, busier, or noisier, then I get distracted. So I've been getting up at uh, 6 to do this, and uh, if I leave it to later on in the day, I probably, and we say this often, well, I'll just, I'll just do it when I have time during the day. But usually, that time never comes. So we need to have a plan, a time, a place, what we're going to do. Uh, again, these are not rules about Bible reading, but these are, these are tips, these are suggestions. We, we should have a plan, I think, to be most effective in keeping these resolutions. Now, in today's world, there's technology. And uh, I had a few uh, screenshots from a couple of popular websites where you can, where you can get uh, resources to help you uh, follow a reading plan or a reading plan itself. Uh, just a, first of all, one, this is not the most popular one, but one that I've used. This is one that I've used. And actually, well, you can't see it from that picture, but some people say, well, I'm not a very good reader or I don't really like to read. Well, what actually, what I've been doing, you might think this is lazy, but there's a icon over here. It looks like a speaker and you can just have the Bible read to you. Now, I also follow along as it's being read because I believe that you can take in more when you see the words and when you hear the words. So I've been doing that, at least for now. But this is uh, ESV online. ESV.org is where you can find it. And if you, there's the Bible, you click on that reference and you, a list will come up, all the different books of the Bible. You can go to whatever chapter you want. And then over here is... A calendar icon where you can click that and if you go to the next page Connor you can go to all sorts of different reading plans and so the one I'm using isn't there but I think it's down below but some of these are just for five days some are 30 days uh, 
you know, you don't have to follow one online. You can just make up your own plan. Uh, you can find a book on this. It's, uh, you can uh, just, I'm going to read one chapter a week and just go through the New Testament, or I'm going to focus on this book of the Bible. It really doesn't matter what. These are just uh, little ideas for you. Uh, there's also probably the most popular Bible uh, app. It's just called the Bible app. And uh, I'm sure some of you already have this on your phones. You go right, this is uh, Bible.com, I think. And I have the two addresses in the bulletin. You click on that, Connor, and then you would go to whatever device you have. And then you can click the next one. If I had an Android phone, then it would go to... I'm sure you all know this anyways. Go to the page where you can uh, download and install it on your phone. Those are just a couple of ideas for you. But all of the different resources we... You can turn the lights on, Lyle. All of the different resources we have in today's world, with technology, uh, using a Bible plan, reading plan, in those ways. So that might help you. Uh, there's, as I said, audio Bibles where you can actually go for a walk and listen to the Bible being read. Uh, All sorts of different ideas. You you can just do it the old-fashioned way and just read a chapter a day. I think it's good, though, not just to go here and there and all throughout the Bible, but but pick some place and go through a book of the Bible or go through the Old Testament or the New Testament or pick one chapter from each New New Testament and Old Testament and, and do that rather than just going here and there and really not understanding the flow of the Bible. That's my preference, at least. So we have many different Bible reading plans. And just a couple of other tips from another blogger named David Murray. Because we might not want to admit it, but sometimes we can uh, get a little in a rut, or maybe even we could say we're getting bored with the reading of the Bible. I don't believe the problem's with the Bible. I believe the problem's with us. That's why we're getting bored. But he gets a, gives a little, few little tips. One about distractions. Ban the cell phone when you're reading. Uh, well, if you're reading on your cell phone, that might be difficult. But <laughs> uh, at least uh, try and limit the distractions. Maybe you want to read from a different version of the Bible. I know some people like to stick to a certain version. But maybe that will bring it alive in a different way from a different version. Uh, Maybe you want to use a devotional first. I've been doing this with the reading plan. There's a devotional from D.A. Carson uh, that goes along with the uh, McShane reading plan, which is helpful. Use a devotional first. You might want to use a study Bible. Uh, That might slow you down a little bit. And uh, I don't think we should always rely upon study Bibles, but it might be helpful to, to do that for a little while. So those are things just to to change things up or limit distractions. These are just practical suggestions for you. Make a plan. There's not one right plan, but just make a plan to to read the Bible somehow, in some way, somewhere, during some time of the day. It doesn't have to be the morning. It can be any time during the day. He also says make just one resolution. He said, you know, you can make two or three, but... The fact that 88% of resolutions fail might tell us we want to limit the number of resolutions we make. Now, thinking about me, I could make 20 resolutions that I need to uh, follow this year, 20 things I'd like to change, but maybe just sticking to one will help you to focus. Make it specific, realistic, big enough to be meaningful, but small and defined enough to be attainable. And then he says, convert your resolutions to habits. He says, willpower is enough to get you started, but you need habit to sustain it. So something for something to become a habit, I forget the stats, but you need to do it for, for quite a few days, maybe two, three months, two, three weeks, I don't know. But before it becomes habit, you need to continue to do something regularly. And you want to reward yourself in some way if you continue with the plan, with the resolution, uh, you know, it's very easy to start something. It's very easy to say, well, I'm going to start reading my Bible. I'm going to read the Bible through this year. And uh, you're motivated. You get up. Maybe if you're getting up in the morning early, it's easy to start that the first day, the second day. But maybe by the second week, maybe even the second day, 
you start to get a little more distracted or not focused. Same as with if you start an exercise program, it's easy to start that first time, those first that first week, and you're motivated. You're trying to lose all the weight in one day, and uh, but then the second week, the third week, uh, it becomes more difficult. And so somehow convert those resolutions into habits. That's something that's difficult, of course. That's why resolutions don't stick most times. You could also share your resolution with somebody. Now, I've shared my resolution with you, so you could keep me accountable, but share it with someone, a friend, a spouse, maybe someone. It'd be really good if they're also resolving to do the same thing, and you could keep them accountable. And of course, as Christians, we should pray for the strength to do or to keep this resolution. In saying all of that, resolving to read the Bible, we must not read it just to read it, to merely get it done, to put our check mark next to the chapter and say, well, I'm done for today. And just quickly read through it and then forget about it. Reading the Bible is important, but being changed by the Bible is much more important. Uh, as James writes in James 1.22, Be doers of the word and not hearers. We could say as well readers, and not readers only, deceiving yourselves. So it's even more important to do the word than to read the word. But in order to do the word, we must hear it, we must read it. So both are important. Do you believe that the words of the Bible are the very words of God? Some of you might not believe that here today. But for those of us who do, then you should believe that the Bible is a book worth reading. That there's value in reading the Bible. It's profitable. It contains the words of eternal life. It contains the words of how we are to live and how we're to have hope and joy and peace and how we are to please God and love others. If you do believe all of that, then you need to resolve to read the Bible regularly. And it would be helpful if you had a plan to regularly read God's Word. A wise plan that you could stick to. And as you read it each day, you would seek to understand it. Not only understand it, but to obey it. That's why we read the Bible. We don't read the Bible just to read it. And we don't read the Bible even just to understand it and to know it and be filled with knowledge. Really, we read the Bible so that we can obey it. And so that means to be the desire behind this resolution to read God's Word. God's Word. So I would encourage you if you haven't made this resolution, if you're not reading your Bible regularly, and it is a great privilege today to have a copy of God's Word. Notice it said, be not hearers only in James 1, 22, because they only heard the Word, most people. They didn't read it because they didn't have it. It had to be copied by hand back then. But we today have copies of God's Word, or they're readily available today for free. Copies of of God's Word. What a privilege that is. The very words of God are able to be read. And so if you haven't made this resolution, I encourage you, I urge you to do so and to stick to that resolution. Let's pray. Lord God, I pray that by the power of your Holy Spirit that you would give us the strength to stick to the resolutions that we have made. When we think of reading your word, I pray that we would resolve, if we aren't doing this now, to read your word daily. Lord, we're prone to give up, prone to forget about these things after we start something. But Lord, give us the strength 
to keep at it. And may we not simply read it, but be changed by your word. We ask in Christ's name.